You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> The Voice in the Void by Scott Patrick Mitchell Performed by Otis Jiry Shep hated sleeping. To sleep was to dream, and to dream was to invite the monsters in. Shep opened his eyes. He was back in the void, that inky black, unfathomable night space where the voice lived. He tried to kick and wrestle against the nothingness, but the void was a black sprawl of endlessness that gripped tight around him. Motion became molasses. Every movement was slowed, excruciatingly so, as if his body was full of heroin, or the air itself was thick glue, pulling at Chep's seams, gripping him in place, keeping him pinned. Not that there was anything to pin. The void was absent of everything, except the voice. Hello, Shep, the voice purred, moving from left to right, as if it were some demonic, genderless ASMR, distorted with growling discomfort. Back again, I see. Let me go, Shep called out, wanting to thrash. Instead, his limbs limply tugged at the movement and failed. His long, blonde hair rippled out around his head like shoreline-bound seaweed. Oh, Shep, the voice, low and guttural. I can't let you go just yet. We need to have a little chat. Shep cocked an eyebrow. This was new. A chat? Usually the voice just tormented Shep's dreams. Not always. Just when Shep found himself in the void. Shep could dream pleasant dreams, but sometimes... When he was really exhausted, he'd sink into a deep, deep sleep and find himself in the void, home of the voice. Or, if he suddenly realized he was awake inside his dreams, the lucidity of the movement would dissolve and the dream would bleed away, replaced by an inky black blank. Here, the voice would torment the edges of Shep's sanity, tickling insecurities into his being or, as it had been prone to do in the early days, it had flick images inside Shep's brain. Its favorite was an image of a playing card made from glass, an ace of hearts. Inside Shep's brain, he'd watch a hammer shatter the card. Every time it was smashed, the voice would swoop into his chest and bite Shep's heart. The pangs of pain would make him writhe. It translated into the real world as some kind of perverse conditioning technique. Each time Shep refused to do the voice's bidding, his heart would sear with a sharp, unbearable burst of agony. Shep learned early on to do the voice's bidding. Dr. Cohen, Shep's therapist, reckoned the voice didn't actually exist, that it was some psychobabble manifestation of Shep's own darkness that it was a vocalized representation of Shep's id, or fears, or of his desire to do dark things, that the heart pains were merely the result of Shep allowing this dark part of himself some kind of physical control. Hence, Dr. Cohen's hypnotherapy sessions of late. They were an attempt to fish it out, to commune with the voice and hopefully to exercise it. But since when had the voice wanted a little chat? Since it seems you've gotten us into a spot of trouble, dear Shep. Us? Yes, us. I hardly think I've got your best interests at heart, Shep spat. You've been nothing but vile to me. I looked out for you, for us. The voice boomed. You made me do terrible things. Shep didn't mean for those words to contain so much venom, but when he spat them out, he could feel them burn his tongue. The accusation echoed around the void, as if seeking the voice out so they could sting it with their bitterness and contempt. Then Shep heard the voice do something else it had never done before. 
It sighed. Hmm. It pondered, a slight, pensive tone edging its way in, in place of its usual invasiveness. I guess we've gotten off to the wrong foot, haven't we? The, the, the wrong foot, Shep spluttered. You've basically tormented me since the age of twelve. Wrong foot, you think? There was a whoosh, as if the voice actually had form and was recoiling from Shep's anger at great force. Shep could sense it moving, out there somewhere in the black inkiness of the void. He imagined he could feel it thinking. Then it sighed again. This time, though, instead of speaking, something even more odd happened. A giant black-and-white checker rug unraveled beneath Shep, a molasses-like mass of the nothingness relaxed its grip on him. He slid down toward the rug, a black leather chair with ornate mahogany feet and arm materialized, took form on the rug. Shep fell into it, his long blonde hair clinging to the sweat on his forehead and cheeks. He was certain this had never happened before. Something was definitely wrong. Or maybe Dr. Cohen's therapy was finally working. Ha ha! Boomed the voice, its short, sharp snort, consuming the void in one deafening instant. Shep pushed himself back into the soft leather chair. There was another whoosh of air, this time accelerating toward him until he could feel the breath of the voice alternating between each ear. It was close, heavy and ragged the way a lover might languish longing and love across the lobes. That Dr. Cohen is the problem, dear Shep, the voice said, alternating between ears. He isn't curing you. I'm not something that can be cured. No, dear Shep, that Dr. Cohen is tinkering. That Dr. Cohen is defiling. That Dr. Cohen... He's taking advantage of you, and you aren't his to use. You're mine. That Dr. Cohen has worse motives than I do. Ha! <laughs> it was Shep's turn to laugh, short and sharp. Worse motives? What on earth could be worse than what you do? I didn't wish for this, Shep. You did. You wished for us to be together, remember? I might be a monster, but that Dr. Cohen... He's turning you into an actual monster, and you don't even know it. He's the... The void was interrupted by the sudden and persistent beeping of Shep's alarm clock. It was loud, and it was urgent. The voice cursed. Don't wake up, Shep. You need to hear what he's doing to you. The voice visited me again last night, Dr. Cohen. Shep's sigh was long, exhausted. He was running entirely on coffee. Jitters jangled his joints, his nerves fueled by caffeine. His left foot hadn't stopped tapping since he sat down in Dr. Cohen's office. His heart panged a little, but Shep was certain that was because of the double-shot flat whites. He could feel Dr. Cohen's icy gaze on his foot. Shep raised a hand over his knee, pushed down, and stopped it from tapping. You seem particularly anxious today, Shep. Why is that? Dr. Cohen spoke slowly. It was meant to be soothing, but his voice always slightly unsettled, Shep. If a snake could speak, if serpents spoke English, it would sound like Dr. Cohen. And that look of his was reptilian, too. Cold, disconnected, hungry. Dark walnut bookcases lined the walls, filled with books and small statues of peculiar humanoid creatures. The desk between Shep and Dr. Cohen was stained oak, a beast-like piece of furniture. It was almost as imposing as the good doctor himself, whose gray hair and eyes were the only light-colored objects in the room, besides the crisp white shirt he wore. Even Shep found that he unconsciously dressed in black Whenever he met with Dr. Cohen, which was peculiar, because any other day Shep would wear bright, bold colors. But whenever he got ready to head to therapy, he wore black on black on black, 
as if he wanted to blend into the dark, somber tone of Dr. Cohn's office and vanish. Why am I anxious? Shep scoffed. I don't know, Dr. Cohen. Maybe because the voice is actually being kind of pleasant at last. Now, now, Shep. Sarcasm has no place in therapy. Sorry, Dr. Cohen. That's okay, heard Dr. Cohen, leaning forward to rest his cupped hands on the desk. Tell me, why do you think the voice is being pleasant? Um, I don't know, Doc. I really don't. Are you sure? Dr. Cohen leaned back in his chair. Shep could feel himself losing his composure, as if the question was meant to have poignancy, an answer. Truth be told, Shep felt unsettled. He wanted to leave, as if coming to the office this day was a bad idea. His chest panged, sharp and hard and fast. Shep ignored it, refusing to winch. Do you think it's being nice? Because maybe, just maybe, this therapy is actually working. And as a result, it's trying to bargain with you in order to retain a place inside your psyche. Hence, it's casting me as the villain. Hmm. I guess. Maybe. He desperately wanted Dr. Cohen's words to provide clarity, but Shep's guts and heart were screaming at him, demanding that he leave. He pushed the panic aside. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the voice appeared when I was young, and at my loneliness. I, I mean, it was just a stupid childish wish, wanting to become a literal monster. I mean, who, who does that? You said at the time that you were being bullied quite savagely. Yeah, mer mercilessly, Shep replied, shivering. Shep could still remember the older boys spitting and kicking him in the hallway of his school, teasing him for being an outsider. In an Australian Catholic school, you were either an Aussie or of Italian descent, either a skip or a wog. There was no place for a boy fresh off the plane from England, no place for a palm, as he'd been called. The older boys reminded him of this nearly every day. So wouldn't it make sense that you'd want to rally against perceived monsters by becoming one yourself? Dr. Cohn inquired. That had certainly been young Shep's wish, for a monster to arrive and show him how to battle the bullies and put them in their place. But his wish had been answered by the voice instead, a strange whispering that had entered his dreams one night, coiling itself around his brain. From there it proceeded to taunt him, calling him useless, afraid, and cowardly. It was nothing more than a new bully of the supernatural sort, one that Shep couldn't shake, one that lived inside him. Yeah, but the voice, the voice is a true monster, Dr. Cohen. It made me do some terrible things. I mean, I ended up tormenting those bullies more than they tormented me. The voice ordered me to track down where they lived. It instructed me on how to set those fires. I literally had no control. I'm just glad nobody died and that I was never caught. And I tried to fight it, Shep continued. But every time I chickened out, I could feel the voice biting my heart violently, like it said it would. I don't know what's worse, Doc. The voice itself or the fact that it's actually conditioned me to feel actual physical pain. That conditioning is still there. Of course, people reckon it's just heartburn or something, but it's not, Doc. It's not. I'm just so f scared, so afraid. Shep could still vividly remember the nights before the fires, how the voice would show him an image of an ace of hearts made from glass, being obliterated before his eyes. This is the pain you'll feel every time you ignore my orders, Shep, the voice had said. How right it had been. Every time someone slighted Shep, the voice demanded revenge. If he refused, Shep would be racked with chest pains until he obeyed. 
He learned quickly to be cruel to others before they could be cruel to him. Another stabbing bolt of pain struck his chest. Shep braced himself and let it pass. It was amazing how much agony you could conceal from others and learn to live with it. Fear can be a form of courage, Dr. Cohen spoke. You were essentially standing up for yourself, and you never got caught, never got blamed. And as you said, nobody died. Tell me, Shep, are you still afraid of the voice? I was, but last night it seemed like the voice was afraid of you. And with good reason, it's coming undone, in a sense. It's unanchoring from inside you. All that fear and loneliness and self-loathing inside of you. You essentially gave it a voice, a persona. You created the voice, Shep. You created it to play brave. But coming to therapy is an authentic act of bravery, you know. So this voice is rightfully scared. It has no place in a healing man. True. Should we do another session of hypnotherapy, Shep? See if we can dislodge it some more. Shep's heart burned as if consumed by fire. Ah, I don't know, Dr. Cohen. I mean, I always feel weird after you hypnotize me. Like, I don't know, empty. That's you reclaiming space from the voice. We should really try another sesh. There was another pang. Shep inhaled sharply. Nah, I don't think so, Dr. Cohen. The doctor opened a drawer on his desk, pulled out a long steel letter opener, and placed it on the desktop. It glinted in the light. No, Shep, I insist. It's crucial. I don't want to, Dr. Cohen. So, too bad, Shep said Dr. Cohen, standing up. Hypnos. Dr. Cohen snapped his fingers. As much as Shep's chest hurt, as much as he wanted to fight the doctor's command, Shep felt the room fall away, dissolve and disappear, as he fell into a sleep-like trance. What did I tell you, Shep? The voice asked, moving from left to right. Dr. Cohen's office was gone. Shep was back in the void, back on the chair on the rug. What's going on? Shep called out into the nothingness. I warned you, Shep. That Dr. Cohen, he's no good, no good at all. Let me out of here now. The voice laughed. The sound was deep and malicious, ricocheting from every angle. Its cruelty made Shep winch. If only I could, Shep, if only I could. You are under hypnosis again. I warned you about this. I don't understand what's happening. I thought Dr. Cohen was trying to help me. The voice tutted over and over, then rested beside Shep's left ear. You want to know what's happening? I've seen it before. Men who believe in monsters can easily become monsters. Except you believe in monsters, because, well, you've got me. And yes, Shep, I'm a monster. Oh, such a wonderful monster. But I don't want to harm you, Shep. I just want us to be monsters together. It's a form of friendship. But him, the voice hissed, swung away and back, nestled beside Shep's right ear. But him, that Dr. Cohen. He only believes in monsters of his own making. The things he's been doing to you while you've been under hypnosis are despicable, absolutely despicable, and they're about to get worse. Look and see. A screen materialized in the void and flickered with static. Dr. Cohen's office appeared upon it. Shep could see Dr. Cohen, who was leaning his arms on the table, staring directly into the screen, into Shep's very soul. He was talking, but there was no sound, just that lizard-like mouth moving, a cruel grin curling at the edges of his lips. This is what your body, your actual body, is seeing right at this moment, Shep. 
the voice said. Here, let me turn the audio on. And what I want you to do, Shep, Dr. Cohen said, is pick up the letter opener. Pick it up now. The footage on the screen moved forward, and Shep could see his hands reach for the long silver letter opener on Dr. Cohen's desk. Shep's hand picked it up. Good boy. Now, this voice in your head is telling you to cut yourself. And you will cut yourself. Because in doing so, when you wake up, I'll explain to you how you believe that this voice in your head lashed out against the hypnotherapy and made you self-harm. But in actuality, I just want to see you bleed, Shep. Horrible, I know. But you're just so suggestive that it's really wonderful to behold. And like all the other times, you won't remember anything. So you're going to cut yourself and believe that the voice inside your head made you do it. Do you understand? Yes. Shep heard himself say, his voice flat and emotionless. Alien. Then explain it to me, Shep. I'm going to cut myself and believe that the voice made me do it. Shep said, the words coming up monotone. Good boy. Now go on. Cut yourself for me, Shep. Made yourself bleed. Shep yelled his protests into the void, but his curses bounced endlessly into the nothingness. This can't be happening, he whimpered, watching the footage on the screen, the images of his hand slowly holding the letter opener up to his own arm. It is, Shep, said the voice. There's two ways we can stop this, though. Shep was crying now, could feel the cool steel of the letter opener's blade against his dreamlike arm. The voice continued. The first is, you can let me take control of your body. <laughs> Absolutely not, Shep instinctively shouted. Or I can take it by force. Sorry, Shep. And with that, Shep felt the chair he was sitting in contort. It flattened to become the long plank of a hospital bed. Long lashes of leather sprang from the sides of it and flailed in the air. Then, with quick cracking sounds, they flicked tight around Shep's chest and arms and his pelvis, thighs, and ankles. Shep screamed in pain against the tight, vice-like embrace of the restraints. Then came the scurrying and squeaking as a horde of rats came surging up over the edge of the rug. The mass of furs, whiskers, teeth, and long ropey tails scampered across the rug and then began pawing their way up Shep's legs as he writhed, impotent against the straps. Shep felt his pupils widen to unbelievable proportions as terror, panic, and fear engulfed him. I'm sorry, Shep, said the voice, oscillating as an echo between Shep's ears. But this is the only way I can take control. This is the only way I can save us. Do you hear me, Shep? Dr. Cohen asked, his voice cold like granite. I ordered you to cut yourself. Now! Shep had the blade of the letter opener pressed against his skin. Just one quick slice and blood, sweet iron-scented blood, would ooze from the wound. Dr. Cohen licked his lips, hungry to see this young man debase himself with neither consent nor control. It would guarantee the doctor's power over him. Then he could truly work on making Shep into a monster. After all, Shep already believed he had the potential for one inside of him. All it needed was a little coaxing, a little development, a little blood. Shep! he cried. Cut yourself now! You know, Dr. Cohen, Shep said, his voice sounding strange as if doubled, a slight echo at the edges. You really should treat your patients with more care. This is hardly professional. But then neither is performing lewd acts on them while they're under hypnosis. Isn't that right? Shep. A cold sweat broke out across Dr. Cohen's brow. Shep isn't here right now. 
the young patient said, lifting his gaze to meet Dr. Cohen's. Shep's eyes were both completely black, from corner to corner with no sign of pupils or irises. In their place was the nothingness of a twin abyss, glistening in the low light of Dr. Cohen's office. Oh, my God, Dr. Cohen whispered, recoiling. But there is no God here, Dr. Cohen, the voice rasped through Shep's lips. Only monsters. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis Jiry. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Again, thank you for listening and have a great day. God bless you.